Welcome to Recalculating Small Business. Like its award-winning book, Recalculating is dedicated to small business in America. Your hosts are Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Don Mazella is the editor-in-chief of the Small Business Digest. Dan Perkins is a registered investment advisor with 43 years experience in managing money. Dan Perkins here, your co-host along with Don Mazella of Recalculating for Small Business. Our radio program is dedicated to you, helping the small business owners increase their profits. We draw our name from Recalculating, voted the best small business book of 2017 by the Independent Press. In this book, it features ways to grow your small business. Now, here's Don Mazzella. Dan, leadership comes in many forms. Ken Pash has written a book, On Course, Become a Great Leader and Soar. I have to tell you, it is a terrific book, and he's here now to talk about what uh, can what can make a small business leader rise higher. Ken, welcome to the program. Well, I really appreciate it, Don and Dan, and I hope we can do something for your uh, listeners that helps them get a little bit further in life than they might be today. Well, before we start, Ken, please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to write the book. <laughs> Well, just real quick, I have one of the distinctions that when I was in my first year in college, I won the lottery. Now, it's not a lottery most people want to win because I'm one of the last people to have been drafted into the military. Oh, boy, with people dying in the jungles of Vietnam, that was not on my bucket list. But what seemed to be one of the worst days of my life, getting drafted, actually turned out to be one of the most phenomenal experiences I could have imagined. And I got to fly. And so flying was wonderful for me, not for the family. And so after my flying commitment was pretty much up, my wife and I decided that I would go run medical centers, which is what I went to school for. And I found out real quickly that I sucked at this one minor role called leading. (laughs) We know it's not a minor role, but uh, I had to figure it out. And the solution that I came up with I had this crazy thought one night. I said, I wonder, could there be something similar in what it gets, takes to get an aircraft or organization off the ground and to its desired location? That actually became the basis for the book that you just introduced, On Course. And that model that we use allows leaders to incorporate all these great ideas and so many other books and put them together and make it work for them and their team. So that's the basis of what I do, and I hope it really does help people get so much farther than we are today. Well, first, how do people uh, find your book? Well, the easiest way, you know, you can go through my website, www.keyvisions.com, and key is a Japanese term. It's spelled K-I, so that's K-I-Visions.com, because you can get it through there, and you can go to pretty much any major bookseller, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Powell's, Books A Million, they all have it available as well. So, Well, now I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Don. Um, Ken, um, interesting title for a book, Soar, (laughs) On Course, Become a Great Leader and Soar. Um, When you wrote this book, how much was it based on your experience or based on what you heard from other people? Were you simply oh, the collector boy. or were you the editor too? Oh, no. You betcha. Everything. All that good kind of stuff. And I wish I could tell you because I have been so blessed to be able to have the experiences and the opportunities and even to just, you know, you talk about others, where there's people that were directly working with me or I was working for or people that I read and listened to and everything else and my own experiences putting it all together. I wish I could put a percentage on it. I don't know that I can. I'm just lucky enough to have thought of this idea and put it on paper. So um, I think we really have to be open to possibilities. And, you know, you worked at Merrill Lynch, right? You you know what that's like, having to be open to possibilities as they present themselves and try to make it such that we can figure out how to make things better in the workplace and how do we achieve those targets? Because let's face it, that stuff that we did at Merrill Lynch where you had to hit those targets every quarter, how do you do that? Well, I think people struggle how to do that, and that's what I tried to do with this 
is because I think one of the worst used resources in most organizations is one of the most important, and that's that human potential that they've got sitting right there. Well, that human potential can can be as can be themselves. Are they using themselves yep. to the greatest possible utilization? Um, yep. In 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 your experience, and as you were putting the book together, were there things that you saw? even today that are going on in small to medium sized businesses that you can, you believe if people will read your book, you can change the whole growth direction of the company. I absolutely do believe that Dan. And, and here's why there are, like we just talked about a little bit ago, there are an incredible number of great ideas out there. But unfortunately, people that read a lot of the leadership books out there, they get more frustrated because when they try to put it together, they don't know how to put it together. They tell them, you know, the, a lot of authors tell us what to do, but they don't tell us how to make that happen. And so that's the purpose of what we simply break down and just call the leader's model. That's the purpose of it because there is no one skill. There is no one aspect that a leader can use and say, oh, that's the way we're going to go. That's how we're going to do it. It's sort of like flying an airplane. That was how I made this connection, that you've got all these different factors and all these different facets, and you've got to make sure that you manipulate them all to the point, and I don't mean manipulate, that you manipulate people, but you've got to deal with them all such that you get your organization off the ground, keep it in the air, and get where you want to go. And it's not just one skill, but it's a bunch of them that you've got to put together. And that's what the model is intended to do, is to help people put all those pieces together and figure out how do we get to where we want to go, bottom line. Ken, we, we, we know that we as a nation came through a very difficult time when we were told by some of our elected leaders that perhaps the best years for America were behind it. Uh, we're never going to see any significant growth. Um, and so the whole psychology for eight years was uh, moderation. Don't remember the famous line, you didn't build that. Um, so that the idea of starting your own business and trying to keep your business open through hard work was was greatly diminished. And then Things changed when Mr. Trump, in fact, it was the basis for why we decided to do this show, is that there are a lot of people who were struggling to try and survive, needed to find out how to prosper in the new prosperity that was, we believed was going to come with the election of Donald Trump. And that's not a political statement. That was really just a, an observation of certain things are going to happen. Now we're finding as of last Friday, unemployment rate of 3.9%. And um, uh, uh, millions of jobs going uh, unfilled. So how, do, how do, does the, the small business community successfully make that transition from you didn't build it to the encouragement, build as much as you can, as big as you can, as fast as you can? Well, that's a great question, and I think that's something that really is at the root of what I do because I tell people I love people and I hate waste, and I believe in people because people have such incredible potential, and it really is locked up inside so many people, and that's why leadership is so important because if we tell our people, no, you can't do that, they might believe it. But if you tell people, let's see how we can make that happen. It's amazing the difference in the way people approach what they're going to do. And I think as we look at it, you know, because we're not just talking about unemployment in general being significantly lower today. Look at the unemployment rates for some of our minority communities. I think they're at the lowest rates maybe ever. So we're talking this this. But look back on business, where business is the focus and creating these jobs and allowing people to go out there and really succeed, it's making a difference across the board. And I think that's the message that we have to get across, is that when business is unlocked itself and they are able and they feel like they have the capability to go out there and make a real difference in people's lives, because let's face it, 
we're not forcing people to buy things that we sell. We have to market. We have to encourage people to believe that we've got that best product. And so when we're working it against our competitors, so to speak, it's sort of like just being at a great sporting match, right? If I can do it better than somebody else, that makes me better. But you know what? It also makes my competitor better. And all those kind of things, when we put them all together, this country is so far and away better than any other place. And I've been in a lot of countries around the world. But the opportunities here, if we let people know how good they are, there is so much that can be done. And there are so many people that have something locked up inside them that we really need to get at even more. Because like you say, there's a lot of jobs going unfilled. But what's the reason? Because there's nobody available for those jobs? Or those people are, I call it, are they unemployable? Because we have to concentrate on some pillars of success, what I call the foundation of success in the book. And one of the key area there's, there is education because people have the potential. We just have to make sure that they have the skill sets to be able to be employed in those organizations. We can go much farther with the, even just the current people we have in the country. I'm not saying that we shouldn't bring in others. There are some incredible people who we've brought in from other countries. But we have people that if we just help them understand, put a little bit of more hard work into your education, you will be able to succeed out there because there is room for you. We need people in all walks of life. So I uh, hope that wasn't too long-winded for you. No, that's fine. I'm, I'm going to ask one more question, then I'll turn it back to Don. Sure. Um, we just had a gentleman on the show who um, said that the benefit of the tax bill is saving him $8,500 in quarterly estimated taxes every quarter. And he's a small businessman, sole proprietorship, said he's going to put that money back in the business. And yet most of the surveys, and we had a gentleman on, I think, from um, Capital Bank. I think that was the right one, uh, Don. And his comment was that uh, a significant percentage of the entrepreneur small business people don't know the impact of the tax bill of last fall and um, which surprised me that they, uh, being a small businessman for over 35 years I taxes are very important to me I'm surprised yeah. that that happened but um, last week uh, uh, an announcement came out that just just startled me Bernie Sanders is thinking about running again for president in 2020. And he's beginning to lay out part of his platform. And what he wants to do is that any person who does not have a full-time job will be hired by the federal government and receive health care free. So he wants to take those, what you said, quote, unemployables, however they are, and put them on the government payroll, not require them to work, but just give them an income and free health insurance. Does that make sense? Well, if I can back up just a little bit, because when we look at things, I love it that we have an, the opportunity in this country to uh, profess our beliefs. Now, part of the problem with that is, we look at it, and I call it, it in the book, I, I talk about this a little bit, the left hand versus the right hand. And a lot of people live in our left hand where we want things to be true and we want things to work out just right. Well, real life collects in our right hand. And unfortunately, as great as what Mr. Sanders talks about sounds, it's impossible to make that work because those people are going to be less fulfilled they're going to feel less a part of the system if they're not actually doing something that they have earned and they have the skills to make it really work for them. So I'm really all about helping people be fulfilled in what they do. And unfortunately, maybe a nice idea, but it just doesn't work that way. People have to be pushed a little bit. I mean, and we talked about competition a little bit ago. That's one of the values of competition. When my competitors are are that much better, that forces me to continue to grow and to continue to learn. And I think that's true for almost every human being. I don't, I've never met one that's not like that. 
And I think the reality is, is we've got to get our people to understand that the way to be really fulfilled in life is to figure out what our purpose was when we were put on this planet and then go make it happen and watch what happens with people's affect and their attitude when they do something. Look at a little kid. You know, when you give every kid a trophy on a team for just showing up, well, I don't think the kids really think that they've really done much other than show up. But when you reward a young person for doing something great, just watch how they light up because they know that they, that came from inside them and they were able to make things work. Well, that's humans all the way through the life cycle. And I think that's what we really need to do is concentrate on helping people understand how do we get to what's inside us and how do we make it better for the world? We don't make things better by just giving people a hand out. We need to give them, like the old proverb says, we need to give them a hand up. You betcha. But then expect them to perform just like the rest of us have to perform. And that's how we get a much better society all the way around. That's my take. That's, you know, and again, it's not political at all, like you said. It's just reality. Well, uh, Ken, thank you for that. Uh, Don, back to you. Well, I've been a a fascinating listening to uh, you two. Uh, I'm going to go in a different direction and and ask you this, this, Ken. Um, uh, As a leader, and uh, you have a team, um, how how do you get your uh, lowest, uh, well, how should we say, your least talented person to uh, be as uh, 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 as good a contributor as your most talented um, player? You know, I think, Don, it comes down to something that Simon Sinek talked in his book about, you know, it starts with why. A lot of people talk about what they do. They have a job description that they share with an employee and say, okay, this is what we want you to do. But they don't give them the bigger picture. They don't tell them what it is that they're contributing to. And there's been a number of studies that go around and, and talk to people in various organizations and how they feel about what they do. And some of the least satisfied people are on that low skill end of the spectrum. And some of them are trying to increase their skills, and some of them are just don't believe they have it within them. And, okay, we can work on that. But some of those that are at the lowest end of that skill spectrum are – you know, least fulfilled because they're doing things, the same thing day after day after day. And they they get bored and it gets routine and mundane and all that. And okay, whatever. But when you talk to others in other organizations who really help their people understand why they're doing what they do and you ask them, and there was one, and I won't even go into the company, but there was one company that was approached and they let their people know what it is, the purpose of the company, why they're, they're in operation. And they ask some of the lowest skilled people in their organization what they do. Do they talk about tasks? Not at all. They talk about what they are contributing to. And they talk about the overall mission. And they recognize, those leaders help them recognize that regardless of where you are on that totem pole in a certain organization, you have a responsibility to help us get where we want to go. And, you know, you want a safe and clean work environment? Well, a lot of the people that do some of the cleaning would be considered as having lower skills than those engineers at the other end of the spectrum. But I guarantee you those engineers probably really appreciate having a clean, safe work environment to do what they've got to do. And if it wasn't for those people, those engineers couldn't do what they need to get the organization together. So I don't care what end of the spectrum you're on. When you know what it is that the organization is trying to accomplish, it makes such a significant difference in the lives of people and how well they do what they do and how they come to work every day knowing that they are contributing. I think that's one of the key aspects. That's my take. You know, it's funny. Just before we went on the air, um, I uh, um, I live in Bergen County, New Jersey, and uh, the Gannett organization has taken over uh, the uh, local newspaper, The Record. And uh, ever since they've taken it over, um, their deliveries have been spotty. And sometimes the paper arrives uh, uh, in the morning and sometimes in the afternoon. And so uh, uh, I've been talking to their customer service people. And, fi- and finally, and I ref- refused to pay the bill. 
And finally, uh, a, a sweet young thing called me from uh, the, their uh, billing department to say why I hadn't paid the bill. And when I explained why, she said, well, I'm only here to, to get payment. I can't talk about anything else. And I sat there and said, you mean to say that that, uh, that uh, when my, uh, I'm telling you that my, when my subscription runs out at the middle of this month, uh, I'm not going to renew? She says, well, I can't do anything about it. <laughs> I said there and said, fine. Uh, you know, now this is, mind you, I've been talking to the customer service pretty regularly every other day. But anyway, uh, you know, we see that in big organizations, but more and more we're seeing that, uh, at least wise in my experience, in smaller organizations as well. It seems that uh, as we've become more automated, we've also become more automated in our uh, personal inter- interactions and customer service. Am I wrong in that perception, or are you seeing that as well? Well, I, unfortunately, in my interactions with companies that we don't work with, I see that a lot. But with the companies that, that I, we work with, and it's not fair for me to name any of those on either side of that spectrum, but we do see it. It's so much better because it's so much different in the way that customers are responded to, and it, and it is more of a, a whole picture or approach kind of thing rather than this no no i'm in this stovepipe and that's all i do and that's all i can handle and we talk about data mining and a lot of people think data mining is a bad thing but look at all the information that is lost by a company that doesn't open up that opportunity to gather information from their customers about things that they could do to improve specifically or things that they're doing really well and take that information and capitalize on it. And that's why I think those interactions are so important because we, we think that data mining is all about machines doing this stuff in the background. Oh, no, no, no. When we have our people out there on those front lines and working with our customers on a daily basis, we need to know what we're doing right and we need to know what we're doing wrong. So when we do what you talked about, I think that is a huge mistake because what a great opportunity to interact and engage and figure out how do we keep this com- customer because I'm going to guess those folks at Gannett know that if they don't service that customer, somebody else will. Well, that also takes t- 10 times as much to get a new customer than to keep an old customer. Uh, customer remember- acquisition cost. You're absolutely right. I mean, that's huge, right? It is. Dan, I'm turning it back to you. Thank you. Uh, somebody once said that the best next sale is from an existing customer as opposed to a new customer because you I, endear yourself to those customers by getting greater and greater penetration. So absolutely. So what, what do you, what do you see today going on in our economy that gives you hope? Oh, I see a lot of things. Like we already talked about the unemployment rate going down to what it is. But I think what we need to do is we need to bring in a bunch of those people off the sidelines who, you know, when we look at the uh, uh, employee participation rate, I think that's an area where we really need to improve and we really need to figure out how do we get those people involved? How do we get them back in the workforce? How do we get them back contributing, not just to the bottom line of corporations and organizations, but how do we get them contributing to the point where they really believe that they're part of all this and they're part of what we do as an, or, as an organization or as a country, you name it, because the more people we have involved in that way, I think the country does that much better. So I think we're on the right path in so many regards, and I think we just need to keep working at it as business people to really figure out how do we do these programs or whatever it takes to get people to understand the kind of things that they could do, the kind of life that they could lead. And I'm not just talking about having all the fanciest toys. I'm talking about going home at the end of the day and saying, you know what, I really did something great today, and I think I feel pretty good about what I contributed. Because I really think that's where happiness really comes from, from a professional perspective. So I see a lot of great things going on. 
And I, I love this country. I wouldn't have given 20 years of my life if I didn't. That's for sure. To the, you know, in service to the military. And so, and I appreciate some of the stuff you folks do too, the, the, your concentration, you know, for the, the military folks out there. So I just wanted to give that shout out back to you guys for doing all that. But there's a lot of great things going on. We just got to keep them going and figure out what makes it work better for everybody. Let me, uh, let me throw out a couple of, of uh, ideas. We have had uh, a good number of people who are in the recruiting business to try and find talent for corporations. And uh, in a recent interview we had with one of them, I suggested that perhaps maybe a good place to begin to look for talent is that talent that might have retired from some other business. We have a, we, we are retiring about 10,000 people a day in the United States every day. And we'll do so for the next 17 years. 10,000 right. people a day are retiring. We retire roughly about the size of the metropolitan city of Chicago every year for the next 16 years. And what's interesting, by comparison, uh, I read an article this morning about Japan. Japan has the lowest number of young people that it's ever had. The replacement rate long ago stopped being there at even. And so they don't have uh, the ability to replace themselves, even though they're trying now to encourage the, Ch the Japanese families to have more children, which they are resisting. But they also have a very low immigration policy, a strong immigration policy. So they're not bringing workers in. Their economy is in serious trouble because they don't have the resources. We have almost 90 million people who are either underemployed or not employed, but I suspect millions of them might look to say, gee, I'm over 65, but I'm not sure that I'm done yet. Maybe there's something else that I could do that I haven't done in my life. What do you think about harvesting the talent in the older pool? Well, I love it, um, being an old fart myself, but... <laughs> But I think when we look at it from the perspective of what they bring to the table and what their life expectancy is like from this point, because if they've hit 65, I think that life expectancy goes to, to the mid to late 80s, doesn't it? Yes. So they, yeah, I think so. So they have the opportunity to still live. And maybe we don't have, maybe they don't want to come back full time. That's fine. But they have so much to offer. And you've, you've hit on a point that I think is a real issue in my world that I'm trying to help leaders understand. We are experiencing a leadership crisis because most of the, like you talked about, 17,000 people a day, was that, did you say? Or is it 10,000 10, a day? I can't, yeah. 10, when we look at that number, and so many of those people are in leadership positions, have we really developed a pipeline to fulfill those leadership positions going forward? I don't think so. I think we're going to have to do what we can to bring some of those people back just to fulfill these operations until the people can get their heads together and figure out we better start doing some real leader, de real leader development, not going to an event, but really developing leaders before those people are no longer capable of coming back to the workplace. So I think we do need to entice them. I think we need to incentivize them to stay on a little bit longer or try something different. Maybe it was not in the same uh, place you were at, but something different. You probably have an awful lot to bring to the table. Yeah, I, I think the idea, um, uh, having been an entrepreneur for over 30 years, people say to me, well, when are you going to retire? And I, and I say, why should I give up what I'm doing if I like what I'm doing? I have, a, and that's what, I have a client who has a next door neighbor who is a money manager in private practice like myself. He's 92 years old, sharp as a tack, and still continues to manage money because he loves what he does. And, um, you know, if, if you can find something that you genuinely enjoy, that gives you personal satisfaction, uh, age shouldn't make a difference. But it's going to be hard to convince a lot of corporations until somebody talks about gee, I just found this great person who's working 
with my executive in charge of sales, and he's he's helped drive, drive our business up another 15% a year. Um, maybe experience will create that. So um, thank you for being with us. Don, back to you. Oh, it, it has really been a, a pleasure. Your, your book again and how people can reach you? Yeah, the book is titled On Course, Become a Great Leader in SOAR. Easiest way to get a hold of us is to go to the website, www.keyvisions.com. Key is a Japanese word again. It's spelled K-I, so it's K-I-visions.com. And, folks, both of you, I've really appreciated this. This has been a great conversation, and I do think there's an awful lot of people out there that we can still get on board this train and keep running down that track even better than we have been. So we've been talking with Ken Pash, um, and he's written an absolutely great book, and we thank you so much for being with us. Oh, I had the pleasure's all mine, guys. I really had a good time. So thank you very much for allowing me to share a little bit of our, our message as we try to help people become great leaders. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2HSA.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit cost. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2HSA.com. That's 2HSA.com. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your featured book. I want to tell you about a recent interview I had with Bob Bethel, a turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail Proof Strategies for Small Business. He tells us of his life successes and failures that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His energy is amazing, and at 74, he proves that you can still have a great deal to give others if you just try. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Beth Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. Don, uh, credit expert John Alzheimer has cracked the code in maintaining a near-perfect credit score, which provides unrivaled scoring consistency. He has a, a program to help small business leaders develop ways of financing their companies. John, welcome to the show. Hey, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. John, take a moment and tell us a little about yourself, what's your experiences, and about your company. Yeah, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm actually an independent operator. I'm a one-man LLC, uh, but my entire 27-year professional career has been spent in the credit world. So I spent time at Equifax, which obviously is one of the national credit reporting agencies, and I went to work for a company called FICO, and unless you've been hiding under a rock for the past two decades, you probably know that FICO is the company that essentially invented the credit scoring system. And uh, since then, I have written several books on the topic and have um, done a lot of expert witness work in credit-related litigation. And now I do a lot of consulting and concurrent work with a variety of, of different credit-related companies, including Vantage Score and Zillow and some other brands that your crowd probably has heard of. Now, um... So you, uh, do you have a website? Uh, yes. It, it, I have a, a considerable footprint on the Internet. Um, okay. John, JohnOldtimer.com is the easiest one to find. But if you Google my name, you'll find any uh, one of a variety of, of websites um, that okay. either uh, have links to my articles that I've either written or been quoted in or uh, other services that I offer. So let me, let me pick up on something that you said because I, I, I want to – concentrate that on a little bit with uh with our audience uh our audience are small business people's uh people forming corporations llc's whatever may start out as a single person like you did and, and grow into a much larger business um how long have you been an independent contractor and what was the decision like to give that give up the corporate world and go out on your own 
Yeah, that's it was I got to tell you it was scary. I have been I haven't gotten a real paycheck from a company since 2000 at the end of 2009. Um and so, you know, I I eat what I kill. So I essentially I'm constantly hunting and and it it was definitely um a little bit stressful jumping from you know, the, the corporate world into the 1099 world where all of your clients um, are, you know, they send you 1099s at the end of the year as most um, LLCs experience. Um, the, you know what it was? The catalyst that, that caused me to do it was my, when I was, I kind of grew up in the credit environment at a very opportune time, kind of at the right place at the right time type of scenario. Um, I started in the scoring industry when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac essentially force-fed the entire mortgage world on the use of credit scoring. And so all of a sudden, this score, this tool that had been used primarily by credit card issuers and, and clearly was flying below the radar of, of pretty much anybody except for bankers, really started getting some national media attention. And um, like with a lightning bolt, it hit people that there was this mysterious scoring system out there grading them without their knowledge, and immediately people wanted to learn more about it. So when I started working at FICO, I, you know, I'm, I'm, off, I'm being a little sarcastic, but I showed up and they told me to pack my suitcase um, because I spent the, the better part of the next seven years traveling the country and explaining what, diff- what credit scores are, what makes them tick, why they're important not only for consumer lending but also for business lending. Um, and, uh, and, and essentially that's, that's where I decided, you know, there may be something here as an as a independent contractor, not only for content for websites that were kind of ramping up around the consumer credit space, but also in the world of consumer credit litigation where um, the, in, in my world, the Bible is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And uh, the number of Fair Credit Reporting Act type of lawsuits was increasing considerably. And I had done a few gigs as an expert witness, either for the plaintiffs or for industry players. And I thought, you know what, there's something here. And so I spent some time learning how to optimize my, um, you know, my footprint on the Internet, um, doing a lot of surveying to find out how companies who look for expert witnesses actually go about finding them and then really worked hard to, to, um, to put myself in a position where I was easily found by them. And it's, it's worked out very well. I'm, I knock on wood, and I, I'm very, very grateful um, and, and, you know, I had a very, very supportive spouse at the same time who had a real job, who was getting a real paycheck with real insurance. And so that certainly was very helpful to know that I had that type of, uh, of a safety net underneath me. And now, really, there's, there's no going back. I don't know. You know, I don't think I even know how to tie a tie anymore. I, there's no way I could report to somebody else. I, I can't work a normal schedule. Um, and, I, and, you know, people who, who work for themselves – um, believe they can do it better than working for somebody else. And I think I've, I've, I've gotten so used to that type of environment that I don't know that I could ever go back. Well, uh, I want to follow up and ask another question just to clarify a, a fact. Where were you working when you decided to go on your own? Uh, I was working at FICO. And okay. um, I had finished, and you'll get, you can call it the seven-year itch if you want. I had just finished my seventh year there heading into the holiday season at the end of the year. And I, I, my, the guy that I worked for, my boss at FICO, who I was really, really liked a lot, he had just taken on a new position. He had left the company. And I thought, you know, if, I don't know that I want to transition to a new boss now. Maybe it's time for me to, to spread my wings a little bit and see if there's something to, to being a, 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 my, own, my own company, essentially. And, and within a year, um, it, I was really self-sufficient. Um, I had done a really good job of paying all, off a lot of my corporate debt that I incurred kind of getting started, um, and, then, and things really have been, have been fruitful since then. But believe it or not, the meltdown, the 2007 meltdown of the, of the mortgage environment and the, the economic crash, um, while it, it destroyed a lot of people's lives, it had, a, it had the very opposite effect on my business because mm-hmm. people became even more voracious to learn more about consumer credit Right. And, and, and I, I found myself in the right place at the right time because I was generally one of the people that, that folks would go to to learn more about this stuff. And so while I certainly would never wish that to happen again, um, it was actually kind of helpful for me because it, it made what I offered in much more in demand. So uh, I've got about two minutes before I turn it back to Don. Let me, let me ask you, um, what is it that you offer to our listeners? Yeah, so I do, I do three things primarily. Um, number one, what, what really keeps my lights on 
um, is the expert witness work. And so if a consumer is suing a credit bureau or if a consumer is suing a debt collector or if a consumer is suing some sort of a lender, um, it, most of those lawsuits uh, eventually have a need for an expert witness, someone to come in and offer non-biased testimony about topics like credit reporting and credit scoring and credit damages. And so I do an awful lot of work. I've had over 300 retentions. I actually counted them the other day, over 300 retentions in the past decade. Um, so I do a ton of that kind of work. I also do, do a lot of content creation. So there's a lot of websites that um, like to have high-quality, easily readable credit-related content, so you know the basics of credit scoring, the basics of credit reporting, how businesses use these types of tools. And so I do a lot of the content creation as well. And so that, that really takes up about a 10 to 12 hour day. Um, and if I was scalable, I could, I could hire multiple people to do what I do. And so th those are really the two products and services that I offer. Well, I, um, uh, I'm taking over, uh, over from Dan. Uh, I have several questions, and uh, it's always good to find uh, both Dan and I have kind of eschewed the corporate life as well, and it's always nice to hear about uh, uh, successful people. But I'm going to go uh, in a different direction and ask you, I've noticed over the last year or two that um, uh, uh, people uh, uh, who oftentimes have uh, minor problems with uh, their cr their credit scores uh, when they go to, to talk to the uh, uh, company are either finding themselves um, out there with uh, talking to someone in India or talking to a computer. Uh, is it true, uh, 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 having done some digging myself over the last couple of weeks, is it true that uh, 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 the, the decisions about uh, uh, scores and, and credit scores are increasingly be, being done by computers and and by people offshore. Well, the the credit scoring systems, whether they are built by FICO or Vantage Score, which are the two commonly used brands in the U.S. Um, financial services world, are are absolutely computer based systems. They're algorithms. No human being is sitting there looking at your credit reports and saying, "Hmm, I think Dan is a 750. I think Don is an 850." That, that, that doesn't occur. It's, it's highly me mechanized and is done in a, uh, using a software that the credit reporting agencies all have installed on their mainframes that's generally developed by either someone like a Vantage Score or a FICO. Uh, as far as the actual credit reporting component, which is, which is actually very different than the credit scoring component, the credit reporting component is largely automated because of the breadth of information that is sent to the credit reporting companies every single month. There are tens of thousands of companies that send information about you and me and your listeners to the credit reporting agencies every single, every single month. Um, and doing that in a manual environment would be absurd because it just simply doesn't work. The consumer dispute process, which I believe is what you're talking about, is in other words, getting errors corrected or addressing things that may not be completely accurate, that, that actually depends. There are some scenarios where uh, more, of the, more of the garden variety types of disputes, things that are easily corrected, um, that kind of stuff is automated. However, all the credit reporting agencies have um, kind of a consumer affairs groups that will take the escalated disputes, the things that are really complicated, things like identity fraud, confused credit files with junior, senior types of scenarios where your report is mixed with another consumer who has a similar name as you. Um, and those are generally done in a more manual environment because they do need a human being's interaction. Hmm. Well, uh, but, but, but let me, what, what is the um, a small business? I don't think there's a single small business that at some point or other hasn't had a dispute or, or either personal or professional. And uh, it's, it seems that uh, from what I've been able to glean in the last couple of weeks, uh, that, uh, that those are the toughest ones to uh, correct because it's all done automatically and there's never a, a person at the other end of the phone. Yeah, and, and, and to underscore that, to, there's a reason why – small business owners have to be concerned about this because unless you have a ton of cash or some really 
um, generous seed investors when you're starting your company, you're going to have to finance it yourself. And the way that people generally finance a new company is by using personal credit or agreeing to be personally liable for business credit, like newly issued business credit cards. So your consumer credit quality absolutely bleeds over into your efforts to finance your business using small business types of financing, at least at the very beginning of, your, uh, of, of the uh, kind of the infancy of your, of your company, if you will. And so it, it is absolutely, you can't, just, you can't just ignore one and pay attention to the other because they do, they do bleed over into each other. Um, the, the, the challenge, I think, with, with dealing with, with information on a consumer credit report really is it, it, there, we're, we're almost dealt with it with a hand that we didn't actually agree to initially. I mean, no one, no one wakes up in the morning and says, you know, I agree to have somebody compile a credit report about me. Um, and no one wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I'm not going to pay any attention to it. It's someone else's problem. They're the ones who created this credit report. They're the ones who are responsible for, for keeping it correct. And unfortunately, in, in the world of credit, that's not, neither of those is true. Um, you, you don't have the right to not have a credit report. You certainly have a right to see your credit report from any company that maintains it, um, but you don't have the right to push a button and just say, remove my credit report, delete it. I don't want it there to exist any longer. So that's number one. So, you, so people who are hung up on that really need to get past that and learn how to, to, to deal with the companies rather than just kind of be angry about them. Um, number two is in the world of credit reporting, the credit reporting agencies don't have a responsibility to correct your credit report unless you ask them to do so. And the reason, the reason that's the case is because – you know, a company that has a credit report on you, like someone like TransUnion is a good example because they're one of the big three credit bureaus. TransUnion doesn't know if something on your credit report is correct or incorrect. They don't know if the collections are wrong. They don't know if the late payments are wrong. They don't know if the balances are wrong. Only you do because you're the consumer and you are the subject of those types of liabilities. And so it's up to you, the consumer, to check them periodically and raise your hand and say, hey, look, there's something on this report that's inaccurate. Here's why it's inaccurate, and I want you to, to investigate it, and I want you to correct it. And the minute you do that, you set in motion a series of events that are largely defined under federal law. And not only does the company that maintains your credit report, they've got to perform an investigation, but they've also got to contact the company that sent them the information, which is usually a debt collector or a bank, and they have to perform an investigation to ensure that what's being sent about you is, is accurate. And they have 30 days to do this. Most of the time, it's, it's, it's done much quicker than that, but they do have 30 days to do it. And the, the cost to you as the consumer is a grand total of zero dollars. There is no cost for those types of things. We're talking with John Alzheimer. John, what's your, your website before I turn it back to Dan? Yeah, the, the easiest way to find me actually is Google. Just Google John Alzheimer, but my website is johnalzheimer.com. If you have a hard time spelling it, you're not going to be the first person, um, but Google will help you if you're having a hard time. We'll, we'll spell it out for our audience, though. Sure. So it's U-L-Z-H-E-I-M-E-R. Hmm. Uh, Dan, back to you. Thank you. John, um, two, two more questions. Sure. Uh, um, why is it that I can never move my credit score beyond 805? So, so 805, first off, is a fantastic score. You're what pretty much any lender in this country would define as being an elite credit risk, which essentially means you're void of credit risk. And so you're having folks throw money at you at really competitive rates and terms because your, your score suggests that you're going to be paying them back on time. Uh, the, most of the scoring systems in the U.S. have a range between 300 and 850, and, and that's, that's both FICO and Vantage score, so there's no difference between the ranges across those two scoring platforms. What, what tends to happen to folks is uh, it's, it's really not that hard to score in the 700s, mid 700s, high 700s, as long as you're paying your bills on time and you're staying relatively debt free and you're not a applying for credit ex excessively, then it's really not that hard to have a good score. Where, where folks like you, who when you finally get past that magical threshold of 800 and you really want to max it out, 
that's where folks, that's where things tend to slow down because there are so many moving parts to a scoring system that you really have to max out every single one of them in order to get the maximum number of points across all of the different metrics in order to get yourself scores in the mid 800s, the 840s, and then, and then of course the magic number of 850. Um, what I always tell people who who have find themselves in the same situation that you're in is you're, you sh- you should switch your strategy from a score improvement strategy to a score maintenance strategy because 805 gets you whatever you want at the best deal that any lender has. There's no incremental value to having a score any higher than that. And so really what you should focus on and what I hope your listeners would focus on if they're in the same boat as you is to really work on maintaining that score rather than trying to get an 805 to an 810 or an 815 or an 820, which may be very difficult to do and and frankly offers you no benefit to do, to, of doing so. Yeah. Here's the here's the here's the the thing that doesn't make any sense to me. My wife, lovely woman, ha- had her own business for 25 years, retired over 10 years ago. So she gets social security, she gets a pension. She has a higher FICO score than I do. She's an 810. Well, How does her, that... congratulations to her. Um, <laughs> so you have a household weighted FICO average of 807 and a half, which is, uh, I think that puts you in about the top 5% nationally, which is actually fantastic. You know, it's funny, I, I joke, but I'm kind of in the same position. My wife still works, but her scores are higher than mine. And, and darn it, if I, didn't, if I didn't work in the industry and she didn't. So, um, <laughs> The, the good news is, is there, there is no gender bias in scoring. It, it's, it truly is all about what is on your credit report and, what, and how well you manage those things. Um, let's, so let's, so that, that, that's something to take away. Let's turn to – now let's go back to our, our listener. Let's talk about credit for small business. Okay. Um, as we know, in many cases, so sole proprietors, uh, you talked about your last paycheck. My last paycheck was in 1989. Wow, that's fantastic. So I, I, I get, did get rid of all my Wall Street suits, and uh, I do have one, but that's about it. Um, but in starting a business today, we, we started, Don and I started this show because we believe with Mr. Trump coming in as president, there's going to be a huge emphasis on rebuilding America and opportunities for small, small businesses to start. Um, what's the credit market look like for, for startups today? really, really strong. Uh, and you know what? If we would have had this conversation a decade ago, it would have been an entirely different answer where, where it was just dry as a bone. Today, it, if you have solid credit, they are throwing money at you. Absolutely. And I'm not talking about, you know, um, with really excessive types of, like hard money types of loans where the interest rates are just absurd. Um, you're getting really killer deals as long as you've got as long as you've got respectable or or better credit. Um, and I, I think that's a product. Well, I'm not an economist, but I think it's a product of the fact that um, we're we, we just got this fantastic tax break. My estimated tax payments um, have gone down $8,500 a quarter. Well, I'm not going to uh-huh. sit on. I'm throwing that money back into my business, and so. Um, and, and I may borrow that's gonna, that's gonna, that is a catalyst for me to expand, which means I may be borrowing money. And so I think I'm, I'm probably in a similar, similarly situated as other small business owners. And so you have lenders that are out there wanting to essentially scoop up that portion of the market that is trying to take advantage of the new tax code and expand or start a new business. Um, and if you've got really good credit and, and decent financials on the consumer side, they're really making it easy for you. So the, in starting up a small business like you did or I did 30-some years ago, um, your personal credit history is an important factor as to your ability to get money. Is that a fair statement? That is, you, that's not only fair. That is, that is absolutely correct. And I've, I've spoken at countless events, trade shows over my 27 years in this business, and I can't tell you the, the ones that have been the most well-attended – and the folks who are the most interested are people who own small businesses, dentists, unbelievable mortgage lenders, people who are in their own they have their own mortgage broker type of business, landscape. You, I mean, it's, it amazes me that people who are in businesses who have nothing to do with consumer credit are so interested in this because they recognize that in order to buy a $200,000 you know, $200, cavity machine, 
they're going to have to borrow money in order to do so. They're going to have to have good personal credit in order to be able to guarantee the business loan. So it is absolutely imperative to have good consumer credit when you want to start a small business. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'll throw it back to Don. We've had numerous interviews on this program with new lenders, new types of lenders to small business, primarily fintech lenders. Yep. Uh, we've been told that the major major banks got out of the small business market after the market crash in 2007 and eight, and the fintech lenders are coming in because they can do things faster, more efficiently, uh, and uh, you may pay a little more in rate, but you get things done faster. What's your what's your experience been with the fintech lenders? Yeah, so my experience has been a little bit different than that. I mean, every time I go to the mailbox, I pull out multiple offers for business credit types of deals from lenders that you've heard of. And so, so I don't know that, that all the major banks have exited the market of, of business lending. Um, you know, I, the, the fintech guys are – are very creative, and most of them are, gen- are run by folks who came out of the, the traditional corporate banking world. Um, and they depend less on consumer credit reports and, con- and consumer credit scores and really depend on other types of things like cash flow, um, and, and, which is fine right up until the point where that doesn't work for them. And so what, what I always tell people is there's a reason why the, the, the primary tool used by business lenders is still a, a consumer credit report and a, and a consumer credit score rather than these, these like the cabbages of the world or the other fintechs who come in and, and focus on small business lending. And that's because those tools still work. Um, are they as nimble as some of these fintech guys? Probably not. But again, to the extent that you're not in that big of a hurry, is it better getting a loan that has, that's 500 basis points cheaper if you're willing to wait a few months, maybe it is. Um, so really, it's just a matter of your personal preference as the business owner as to what, you know, what the trade-off is. Do you want the money faster? Are you willing to pay more for it? Or do you want the money at a more affordable rate, which leaves more margin for you to do other things like expand or, or hire people or, or pay more competitive wages? You know, as a, as a one-man LLC, I can't answer those questions because I don't have any employees. I've got contractors. Um, but for me, it's, it, you know, I, I'd rather wait for uh, the, 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 the slow dime versus trying to get that quick nickel. Okay. Thank you, John. Back to you, Don. You bet. Well, you know, this is fascinating. We have, uh, I'm going to take the last question today and ask, uh, how important is, uh, is the, uh, how much, uh, you owe, for instance, on a mortgage for the house, et cetera, to your, uh, score? Yeah, not, not very much at all. I don't want to call it negligible, but it is pretty darn close. Um, you know, there, there are three types of consumer debt. Uh, there is revolving debt, which is your plastic, your credit cards, your general use cards, your retail store cards. Um, then your installment debt, which is going to be your fixed payment for a fixed term, things like student loans, auto loans, mortgage loans, boat loans, personal loans, things like that. And then open credit, which is things like your American Express green card, where you incur a balance and you have to pay it in full every single month. And a lot of business credit cards have open terms where you, whatever you spend in the month, you've got to pay off by the due date because they don't have revolving types of terms. The, the installment debt is normally secured by some asset, whether it's a house or a car or a boat or a motorcycle. And people don't want to lose those things. They don't want someone to come get them in the middle of the night from your garage and you don't want to get kicked out of your house. So people tend to pay those debts um, more consistently than people will pay their revolving debt because there's nothing to, to come repossess if you don't pay your credit card. They can't come repossess something that you bought with a card. And so the default rate is much higher on plastic than it is on the installment loans. Credit scoring systems see this, which means that the effect of having installment debt on your score is actually very small relative to the effect of having credit card debt on your credit reports. You can have a killer credit score with hundreds of thousands of dollars of installment debt, and you can have a very troubling credit score by having twenty or thirty thousand dollars of revolving debt. So, if you're going to choose what type of debt to be in, it is absolutely better to be in installment debt than it is to be in revolving debt. Well, we're, we've been talking with John Oldheimer. I think we could we could talk with him for the rest of the day, but unfortunately, we run out of time. John, your website again, and how people can reach you. John Oldheimer.com. Uh, again, spell it out for our, our audience. 
Sure, J-O-H-N-U-L-Z-H-E-I-M-E-R.com. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a very illuminating time. Yep, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. We have been talking with credit expert John Alzheimer. A link to his website will be on www.recalculating.biz tonight. On our website, you can also hear recordings of every recalculating show. You can email us at editor at recalculating.biz. Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. We hope the information you received on today's episode was helpful to you in starting and growing your business. Please go to our website, recalculating.biz, to contact us, to listen to past shows, and see special offers. Until next time, remember, if you grow, we grow. Join us next week for more helpful ideas to make your business a great success. Recalculating, a program designed to help you be successful 